So if you've been watching this then, playing uh, Heads of State, you'll know. And this always happens, I don't always catch them, but I made a big mistake. In the last scoring round, I scored this as blue, because you know it's dark, and it's kind of blue on the background or whatever. It's a yellow player chip. So that's eight points that blue does not get and that yellow gets. Goes up here. And blue is further back than I thought. Okay. Well that's alright. Uh other than that, what we see the red player got the first move after this. He didn't do anything. He actually drew cards and discarded. He's trying to build up he drew a treachery card, enough cards that he can kill a king, so he can build a king, because he can't anymore. Uh, there are only four countries and five players. One of them is going to have to do murder in order to get a full family set. Of course, only three people get value for that, so if you can't do it quickly enough, it's not going to matter anyway. And a king isn't all he needs. All right. And that's the last one going up. I'll put this back on the charger and get back to whatever it is I was doing, which I think is the yellow turn. Uh, so as we've been noticing, plays tend to be bigger, taking a couple of card turns, maybe one, two, or three, to affect what you really need. Uh, you might be able to do something along the way, but in this case, we see a major one that just happened that was saved up for. The red player went, blue was just drawing cards. The red player went and killed the black king. Played himself. Speaking of which, these don't need to be here. Black uh, has already gotten the score on that. Uh... This not only gives him one of two things, he still needs an Earl towards the family, but it also gave him the complete uh, tour of France, which means he's the second person to get that, getting himself six quick points. And these counters go back into his hand where you can use them. He needs an Earl still. Uh, but he had to use two cards, two, uh, two guillotines actually, to kill the king and then replace him. And, you know, that's a, a very expensive thing. At the very least, it takes two turns. It takes two turns to draw enough treachery cards for that to happen. And now we have some possible instability in Spain by those two cards, right? Okay, on to the green player. Well, we played around a few more times and Red just bought an Earl, which gets them, and I got him over here after killing one, which gets them the eight point bonus, which they take, puts them back into things a little bit, at least in the middle of the pack. Uh, yellow had already gotten the first one, green picked up the second one, which put them way up there too. Uh, they got that off of, I don't remember, they had to get a marquee somewhere. It's going to be Green's turn, but this means most of the big points are gone. Uh, we still got a couple of bonus points sitting over here for the tours of Britain or Spain, but for the most part, it's what countries can you control? And that's real bad news for the three people who aren't right up at the top. I don't know if they're out of it or not, but clearly Green and Yellow are in the position where they've accumulated enough points. And as long as they can get kind of a balance with everyone else, they should be doing okay. What I haven't taken into account, though, is the value of these things. At the end of the game, we went over this already, you can get 16 points for the most kings on the board. Well, right now, everybody's got one, but that's a pretty big jump. Most princes, 14. Most dukes, 12. So there's going to be a significant amount of points scored for how many of those cards that you, you, you hold. Not what's on the board, but how many you've created throughout the game. Uh, how many new dynasties in that kind of level that you've actually made. It's an interesting phenomenon. Uh, the points 
collect up. It's not like in a war game where usually it's who's got the most at the end. Here it's meh. games like uh, Empires in Arms and Europa Universalis, which are semi-war games, kind of follow this with the I'm getting points every turn, and some straight board war games do too. But all the same, uh, that's more of a Euro feeling of the hey, I collect points all, all throughout the game, and you, you can't really use the points for anything. They're just scoring. Uh, as opposed to, say, 18xx, where you have a pile of money, that money begets more money, but you could also lose it. Uh, anyway, onward. Interesting little rules moment here. Uh, the yellow player had cards in hand to create a baron uh, and they weren't they had the option on Spain using the Inquisition but both their barons are there and blue well they could have hit a red baron but that didn't seem too exciting to them so they're here thinking well maybe there's a green baron somewhere there isn't, but, you know, you can hope. And they drew a card, and they got a Spain Inquisition one. And the question comes up, can you murder your own people? Uh, the rules don't seem to indicate that you cannot. The treachery card rules seem to indicate that you can just target anyone, anyone of that type. Why would you want to do this other than to throw cards away? Well, remember, these are worth victory points at the end of the game. And if you create a new noble, you get one. So, I'm going to try to kill my own dude. And I fail, which is kind of cool. Okay. Well, we've had a lot of drawing and infighting and looking and saying, oh, what can I do? I need to collect this. I need to collect that. And I need, you know, to make short-term decisions, to make long-term goals work better all the kind of good stuff and it feels fairly easy in this to make those thoughts compared to some euros for me uh, but anyway we came to a kind of key point where I mean we're deep in this there's only like three cards left and it's it's about to blow uh, and people have been drawing you know a single card from the assassin deck in, or the treachery deck in the hopes of getting the right color assassin that they can do it. Well, it finally happened. Blue got the right colored assassin for uh, destroying the uh, killing the yellow English king. And that worked. He's got another king now. Well, equally importantly, perhaps, he got the cycle. So he gets three more points. If he was anywhere near the, you know, winning the game, this would be a powerful swing. As it is, it may put him into the sort of position where he won't be quite so far, you know, out of it as otherwise. Because he might be in the ring, in the uh, market for that 16 points for two kings. All right, well, after having done that, and I mean, he got lucky. He had to draw an English card. There were two assassins out there, but they wouldn't help him. Maybe. Ah, the game's not quite over yet. Okay, well, Red gets a chance to go, too, now. Well, Red managed to draw and a pair up. They got a pair of Axemen. They went for the same thing. They took the blue player out of England as well. We got something kind of like you know, the multiple revolutions hitting England. And they also tried to make an assassination or a hanging against this guy, just because that's all they had points for after putting a new king in play. Does it end? It does. Okay, well let's count our points. Uh, first, we get our normal points for uh, end of a turn. Since Britain just fell, let's look and see what happened there. Because that's probably the le most volatile of the solutions. Four, five, six, it looks like red gets the eight points. And then, who's next? Two for black. So black gets the three point. And it's interesting how, you know, yellow and blue were the powers that had been there, but now they've been knocked out. 
okay, let's go down to Spain. Over in Spain, green has four, five, six, because there's no one in the position above him. Uh, that's probably pretty good. So he'll get seven. And then what's second here? That's a lot of pairings. We got two, two, and two. Black's going to get that too because it's got the highest value and he's on top. So he gets four. All right, let's go to France. Now France, we have a, oh, it's still a red king. We have a yellow prince now instead. Uh, things may have shifted a little bit here. Four, five, six for red. Black's not really in it. Two, three for yellow. Two, four for green. Oh, wait, black is two, three, four. So green and yellow, or green and black are in the lead here. Let me make sure of this. Two, four, two, three, four, two, three. Okay, so red gets the first place with the big 10 points. And that's huge. But then green is going to because he's got the highest noble in a high-valued area. Green is going to get second place. It's only two points, but that's okay. All right, now on to, last but not least, Germany. Blue. Blue totally has this. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I'm just going to hand them their six points right off the bat. However, what's second here? Looks like two points for green as opposed to two points for yellow. Let me make sure of that. Because I, I think the highest rank beats out. But yeah, this is a, it's a close one. Let's see how this is red. Ties are broken. Highest ranked noble in the country. No. No, that's... I actually have that wrong. I don't think green got this one. I think black got this one because a duke is higher ranked than that. I misplayed it. Okay, so green did not get the France points. Black did. Let's change that. Two points for green. Two points... For black and over here who's the highest well a duke outranks nope a prince outranks a, a duke so the prince will pick up yellow five points and i may have gotten that wrong and of course by talking and everything i may have totally screwed up the victory point markers uh, but you know I'm sure somebody will catch me. Okay, so that's most of the points. We're almost done, but we still got something else to do. And I got to come back to do that because I got to sort the cards and see who has what. Uh, they're kind of messes and it would be hard to count at this on camera. Okay, so let's start doing the count offs for the different nobles. The first one is the most barons. That's worth four points. Blue has one, red has one. Green has two. That's not bad. Yellow has three. Black has two. Yellow is going to collect those four points. Put these back. So yellow gets four points for that. See, it's becoming this little race, isn't it? Uh, okay. Uh, the next one is counts as six. Blue has three. That was pretty good last time. Red has three. If there happens to be a tie, they split the points. Green has one. Yellow has two. Black has one. And it is indeed a tie, with red and blue each getting three. And don't ask me what happens if that number's not uh, evenly divisible by two. <laughs> That's why you look things up in the rolls, right? 
Okay, on to the Earls. And these should be worth eight, I believe. It's pretty simple progression. Two for blue. One, one. We know black has a pile of these. Two for yellow. And three for black. Earls. And there are six points. Go over to the black player. All right. Marquees are worth ten. One for blue, one for red, two for green, one for yellow, and black made a play for these late in the game, played three of them, so he's going to get that ten points as well. And we're beginning to see that there are different ways to win this game. I mean, blue is out of it, there's no question, but black was far behind but started collecting these points in, towards the end that are kind of hidden so that other people weren't picking on them at all. Dukes. Dukes are worth, what, 12? So one, one. Green has two. This may be enough. Dukes are kind of expensive and hard to get. Black also has two. So they share that. At six points each for green and black. Now we go to the princes. Princes are worth 14. It's a pretty good payoff given that they're the highest valued thing you can still use a courtesan on. Uh, one for red. Somebody's probably going to get a deal here. Two for green. Two for yellow, and that's it. They have to split the points again. Green and yellow, seven each. And now comes the big one, which is the king. He's worth 16 points. But again, if you had the majority in princes and two people are splitting the king, you're ahead. And what we have here is everybody has a king, except for the last two people, red and blue, who each had two because of Britain's troubles. So they each get eight points, and that keeps Britain kind of in the game, and, well, we don't really need to talk about blue. All right, so green pulled out a victory. They had been in the lead all along, but the pack is pretty close together. If I screwed up with blue, count-wise or something, that would easily explain this, and I wouldn't put it past me to have made an error at all. Um, I'm going to come back for a review, but let's think a little bit about what what uh, anything we might have learned about strategies or anything here. There are so many different ways. Uh, I'm not sure why blue is so far behind. They seem to be off to a good start early on. Now, things definitely got compounded when they went for a high-risk option at the very end, uh, looking to draw a card so that they could kill a king and they wasted some turns on that and made some bad plays. But they were well behind before that. And that strategy actually paid off for red, more or less. Um, Blue had a strong holding. They made this decision early, right at the very beginning to go for the German states and to go for second in them. And they ended up with first and first isn't worth much. And they ended up very strongly there in first. For whatever reason, they had trouble gaining a lot of traction over in their secondary choice, which was Britain, uh, which they wanted to make their primary uh, as long as they could keep themselves in the running in Germany. They collected the, uh, the first place for going around the wheel in Germany, too. No, they got second there. So... Even in Germany, they weren't doing as well as someone else was early on, which was their plan. But that someone else would have been yellow, I believe. And yellow had fallen way behind early. And they were right up in it. I mean, they were right at the, at the very... Up until this last turn, they were definitely, uh, you know, doing very well. They just didn't have the correct collection of cards to push them 
over, I think. Plus, they got knocked out of Britain. So what really happened with yellow, I think, was that case of everybody ignoring someone and them getting away with stuff. Now, everybody could have been ignoring blue in the middle game, but there, many times, you're, you're hitting things for opportunity. In the early game, you're hitting someone. Be if you're hitting someone, it's very targeted. It's either you absolutely want this, or uh, they're so far ahead that you, you're, you're just going to always pick them. You know, So you, you ignore the person behind. But as we got to the middle game, we saw blue being attacked because he was standing on things that people could attack. They could attack them because they had the right color and the right type of noble to build. Uh, there's no real point in killing something if you're not gonna uh, if you're not if you're not gonna build it right away. Although if the next person can build it, it might be worth it for you to kill something, take it away from someone. We didn't see any of that in this. Another thing we didn't see in this was flushing. Nobody once flushed this. And thinking about it, I'm just not sure that it's a very good tactic. You only get one card if you flush. You get two if you assassinate, right? You get one of each type. But you only get one card if you flush. There's no guarantee that you're going to get anything particularly good. You've always got the option of drawing off the top of the deck. So I could draw three cards off the top of the deck and get almost as good a choice as I do off of the flush. I think it's a bad option for replenishing your hand with useful cards. Is it a bad option for other reasons? Well, it doesn't speed up ending the game because it gets reshuffled back into the same deck. So, because of that, it's not going to be a, a useful strategy for pushing the game further. The final thing is, are you getting rid of cards somebody else needs? Well, I guess if the entire deck is sitting there and it's all really good and you somehow know this for the next player and you can't get rid of what they need maybe <laughs> it seems pretty damn unlikely to me so i think flushing will almost never happen all right i'm going to come back with a review uh, after i clean it up a little bit and I'll tell you this much i enjoyed it more than i thought i would after reading the rules alone that happens a lot with the new game though